Okay, we have talked about electricity, we have talked about magnetism. Light is electricity with magnetism put together, right? So, if, here's a woman with one of those rods that we talked about that is positively charged, right? And we said if I were to take a rod like that and, and if I, were, remember that I talked about an ele electron, I bounce the electron and it says ouch, right? So, in this case, instead of bouncing the electron, you're taking a rod that has the electrons, or if it's positive, like the excess protons, and you wave it from side to side. And as it waves from side to side, it gives off a change in the surrounding electromagnetic environment. So, just like the electron, you bounce and it's a ouch, and you keep bouncing it faster and faster, and the frequency goes up, or you bounce it slow and slow, and the frequency goes down. The same thing here, by oscillating this wand, if you will, from side to side at different frequencies, you can send off an electromagnetic wave with different frequencies. That electromagnetic wave, if you increase the frequency to a level that's high enough that you and I can see it with our naked eye, we will literally see light. So if you were to take a wand, charge it up, and move it fast enough, it would look like it's lighting up, right? So if you want to patent that, you, that's a way for you to create one of those lightsabers from uh, Star Wars. Right? Or, for instance, if you, if you had an electron that you bounce back and forth between two extremities, right? You get your lightsaber one, press this button, electron oscillates back and forth. If you set the frequency such that it oscillates at a frequency matching blue light, you'll end up with a blue saber. Change the frequency. Make it for higher, like zzz, higher, what happens is you get purple. Make it lower, it can get down to red. Amazing? So that's basically all there is. It there are little, there are some details that you'd have to work out, like how do you get the electrons to do that, and the second thing is how do you get the electrons to not bouncing off of the air molecules and dissipating. Little details, right? Okay, so here's the woman. There's the wand. She's waving it back and forth. That creates an electric field. The pink field here along the Y. Okay, let's call this the Z direction. This is the X direction. The blue arrow is the Y direction. So X, Y and there's the Z. So, the electric field is oscillating vertically upwards, then downwards, then upwards, then downwards in a plane where this is the direction of wave travel. Here's the direction of wave travel and the, elec the electron oscillating up and down creates this electric field oscillating up and down. Now, attached at the hip to this field is this magnetic field that is oscillating in a plane perpendicular to the electric field. Electric field is oscillating in the vertical plane. The magnetic field is oscillating in the horizontal plane, right? So electric field does this, magnetic field does this at the same time. So they're doing this together. So this combined wave is called an electromagnetic wave. And it's waves like this that carry your TV signals, your radio signals, AM radio, FM radio, right? As well as light, as well as X-rays, as well as gamma rays, cosmic rays, and so on. There's particular kinds of cosmic rays, but not all of them. So electromagnetic wave is an energy carrying wave emitted by a vibrating charge, which is typically electrons. As it oscillates back and forth, gives off the wave. It's composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. They basically regenerate each other, is the point that it's making there. Okay, so if you look at frequency in hertz along the x-axis, very low frequency, which for electromagnetic waves, this is a low frequency. That's 10,000 times per second. By the time I say one Mississippi, the electron has jumped up and down 10,000 times. Here it's one million times. So in this range of 10,000 through a billion, it's radio waves, kind of waves that you listen to in your radio. Microwaves are faster, order of 10 to the 10 oscillation, oscillations per second. Now we head towards a trillion oscillations per second. This is the number of oscillations, number of times that the electron bounces up and down per second. At a trillion through a hundred trillion, you get infrared. So these are the waves that, when we say infrared waves, if you have a hot object and you bring your hand close to it, right? Let's say that you, just, you, you were using a stove and the stove top is no longer red hot, but you want to make sure that it's, I mean, you don't want to touch it, but you bring your hand close to it and you can feel the heat coming off of it. What's happening is the stove top is emitting, it's still got electrons in it that are jumping up around at that frequency that's giving off electromagnetic waves that you are sensing. Those would be the infrared waves. Increase the frequency past 100 trillion, you end up with a very narrow band that's visible light. Increase past that, 
to a million trillion, you know, we're heading past the ultraviolet into X-rays and then the gamma rays. So all of these are very high energy rays. You all know not to spend too long in the sun without sunscreen and so forth, right? That's ultimately because of these rays, because of ultraviolet rays. Because the energy of these rays is high enough to penetrate through your skin and to damage cells, right? That's why you get sunburned and so on, if you stay there long enough. Now, X-rays, you can get like much more severely burned with X-rays or with gamma rays. These can actually ultimately cause enough damage to kill you if there is enough, right, uh, dosage coming in. But prior to that, they'll create enough destruction to, they can start cancers in you, or if they, uh, they impact your genetic cells, then you'll end up with three-headed children and stuff like that, right? Which might help them, but on the other hand, it might not. Three brains better than one, right? Okay. So, as, so this is making the point. Here's a red wave, a green wave, and a violet wave. Which of these has the highest frequency? Violet. Which has the least frequency? The red, right? Which has, okay, in this case, which has the longest wavelength? Red. And the shortest wavelength? Violet. And between those two extremes is green. So that's basically all this is saying. If you look at the different colors of light, so if you look at your neighbor's shirt, right, and you see his shirt, which is bright blue, right, you can see that the electrons are oscillating at a frequency that gives off light that looks bright blue. Right? Or if you look at our shirt and it's like... I'm sorry? You sure it's red? Okay, so at least one student is awake. It's great. Extra credit to you. Right? Okay, so red. So his red shirt has lower electrons that are kind of lazy. Right? They're kind of like oscillating kind of slowly. Right? Now, anybody with kind of purpley, I don't see anybody with purpley stuff. Purple, no. Nope. Okay, so blue, right? So if you look at Samantha's top, which is kind of blue, right? So that's kind of the closest to purple. What happens is that the electrons on her shirt are oscillating at a higher frequency than the electrons in his shirt. I mean, that's literally what's, to a first approximation, right? What's happening. Really, in a later lecture, we will talk about the fact that white light is impinging on her shirt and her shirt is absorbing all of the light waves except for the blue. That's why her shirt looks blue. So that's really diff a little different from what I said, right? So electromagnetic spectrum is this range of all these different frequencies of light, right? Of electromagnetic waves. Okay. <clears throat> a sheet of glass here. Sunlight coming in has ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared. What happens is the sheet of glass lets in certain frequencies. It lets in visible light frequencies. It stops the infrared and the ultraviolet, mostly. So the bulk of the visible light comes through. So this acts like a gate. So that window that we have here during daylight, what happens is the bulk of the ultraviolet and the bulk of the infrared are stopped. Now what happens is if you look at sunglasses, you, you, some of them say, they have statements about ultraviolet blocking and stuff like that, right? So some fraction of them, some of it just may be marketing, but some fraction of them can actually include some elements in the composition of the glass itself or alternatively on a thin film that's coated on the glass that absorb even more of the ultraviolet to protect your eyes from ultraviolet and so forth. Okay, you all know what transparent means? It basically means the, ob the object, in this case the glass pane, is transparent, light is able to come through it. That's all it means. The converse of transparent is opaque, which is like the wall. Light is not able to go through the wall, right? So this is the mechanism, allegedly, of light making it through a glass. So, I mean, if I were to ask, how is the light making it through the glass? To a first approximation, I would think, oh, that's really puzzling. The glass is totally solid. I can't stick my finger through the glass. How is the light wave able to make it through? Isn't that weird? They're really strange. So this is believed to be the case of how the, the light wave makes it through. So the light photon comes here to the first atom in the glass. The atom kind of absorbs it and gets excited, like and starts quivering like jello, right? Because it's all excited. Now then it burps out that, that light wave, which then goes on to the next atom, which absorbs it and gets all excited and quivers like jello. Then it burps out that light wave to the next atom. So through this sequence, each of the atoms, or some combination of atoms of path, absorb the light, re-emit, absorb the light, re-emit, absorb the light, re-emit, right? Until finally it, it gets burped out at the end. Is the glass always like vibrating? Do you see it? Yes. The, 
just by virtue of, even apart from this phenomenon, by virtue of the fact that it's at room temperature means that the atoms are all vibrating. Right? Everything around us is vibrating at a frequency with that distribution that we looked at with black body radiation. Right? And depending on the temperature, that shifts. If you make it colder, it shifts to a lower vibration. If you take it to absolute zero, in principle, there's no vibration. In principle, right? But the hotter you make it, it vibrates so much that they break all their bonds and go off to do their own thing. Extra credit for the questions that you've asked. I think you've asked two questions, right? At least? Yes. Okay, you all know what a shadow is. Here's an orange floating around in space. There's a light obviously floating somewhere there and cast a shadow. The shadow is the region where the orange kept, prevented, kept the light from getting through the orange to that spot. So that is a crisp, if you will. It's got a sharp edge. Notice, sharp edge. But this is a diffuse shadow. A diffuse shadow arises if the light source is much bigger than the orange. Right? Or if you have multiple light sources. So when the lights are on in this room, if you hold your hand above the tabletop, you see a diffuse shadow because there are so many different light sources. If we were to cut this all down to one single LED, bulb and if you were to place your hand here you'd get a sharp shadow so we've talked about opaque and we've now talked about shadow okay you all know about eclipses lunar eclipse solar eclipse and so forth right so a lunar eclipse okay a solar eclipse what comes between us and the sun to create a solar eclipse okay one person seems to know the answer what comes between us, for everybody else who didn't answer, what comes between us, okay, for, except for the two people who answered, what comes between the earth and the sun for us to experience a solar eclipse? Okay, you're right, the mothership. Now, what happened? No? Okay, you're right. So the moon, three and a half of you seem to know the answer. So the moon comes between us for a solar eclipse, right? What comes between the moon and the earth for a lunar eclipse? The sun. No? What happens if we have an eclipse where the sun is between us and the moon? We're all slightly dead. You're right. <laughs> so we really so it's a good thing that the sun does tend to not come between us and the moon, right? Yes. So what happens with a with a lunar eclipse? The Earth's shadow. The Earth's shadow. Because you're right, the Earth is between the Moon and the Sun in this case, not between the Moon and us. And the Earth's shadow then falls on the Moon, and right? And so... <clears throat> By the way, even the ancients were able to figure out that the Earth, that the Moon is actually a spherical object just by looking at, at eclipses. Right? By looking at an eclipse, you see the circular shadow, right? Coming over the Moon, and so by the shape of this, you can tell that the Moon is itself a sphere. And secondly, you can also tell that the Earth itself, if you can infer that that shadow is that of the Earth, that the Earth is also a sphere, or at least a flat circular disk. So, <clears throat> lunar eclipse, what happens is, in the case of the full moon, when the moon is up there and here's the Earth and there's the sun, you see the complete reflection, the daylight side of the moon, and so you end up seeing a full moon. Now when the full moon then moves into the shadow of the earth, you end up with a lunar eclipse where the moon does not see the sun at all, right? In the case of a solar eclipse, what happens is, now in this case the moon is approximately between the sun and the earth, so you have a new moon because as we look here, look here, the side of the moon that's facing the sun is the bright side, the day side, and that side is away from the earth, so when we look from the earth at the moon, we're looking at the night side of the moon, so you end up with a new moon, and when the new moon then moves into the direct path of the sunlight between the earth, rather the sun and the earth, you end up with the shadow of the moon on the earth, and for those witnesses, humans, or whatever, who are right inside the shadow of the moon, you end up getting what you call a solar, a total solar eclipse. For those who are outside the complete, the, the umbra, the deepest part of the shadow, you'll end up with a partial solar eclipse. I'm sorry? Solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, happening in November 13th and 14th. Is it? It's over Australia, so we're not going to be able to see it. Okay. 
I didn't know that extra credit. Yeah, those went not too f in the not too distant fa past as well. Yeah, I forget how often they are. Cool. Yeah. So if you want a total so total solar eclipse, there are people who actually travel to other countries to see these. There's one somewhere on the planet. Oh, is there? Yes. Okay. There's a solar eclipse somewhere on the planet. Huh, I didn't realize that. Because the eclipse That's really interesting. Uh, oh, in answer to your question, that would be the case. Uh, like it would be evi very evidently the case if these were all if the if the moon were traveling around the earth in a plane that's exactly in this plane then that would be exactly right but the moon is not traveling in in this plane it's traveling at some kind of an inclined plane and since it isn't traveling in this plane then that's why we don't see I'm not sure if that's a correct statement it may be right extra credit if you can figure it out and let me know right because that's a function of what what is the plane of orbit of the moon with respect to the plane of orbit of the sun, right? Yeah, but even then, I'd have to think. Okay, somewhere. Okay, extra credit if you can provide me some rationale or some indication that that is the case. Okay, that's why I teach. So always, always somebody who comes up with something that. I hadn't thought of, right? Okay, so here, here's the sun, here's the moon, and what happens is the rays from the sun are coming from the entire face of the sun coming towards the earth. And if you look at the rays that are coming from this side of the sun, they travel along these paths, so that creates a shadow shift upwards. The rays coming from the top face portion of the sun coming downwards create a shadow that shifted downwards, and similarly around the entire periphery of the sun. So this creates a series of circles that ends up with creating a like two circles. One in the center that's very very dark called the umbra and around this is the not as dark region of the shadow called the penumbra. So any person who's in the umbra will see a total solar eclipse. Any person who's in the penumbra will see a partial solar eclipse. So the umbra is the darkest part of the shadow at the center. The penumbra is the not so dark part of the shadow. Okay, these things you're probably all familiar with. If you look at the uh, human eye, you end up with these components. Here's the cornea, here's the eye lens, the lens of the eye. There's the retina, which is basically, it has the rods and the cones and so on, right? So light falls on those and then the rods and the cones have a chemical reaction to the light, which then triggers an electrical signal, which then triggers a chemical signal, electrical signal, chemical signal that travels. It looks like there is some processing actually involved in the data in the vicinity of the retina and then it goes to the brain which then does the processing that somehow converts it in some fashion that nobody has a clue how into perception in the mind right fovea, fovea is basically a dark okay here's the blind spot and the fovea i think is the the region of the highest concentration of the the cells the light visible cells and um, so typically when we look the amazing thing is the highest resolution part of your eye is a very small region. But what happens is the processing capability of our eye slash brain is such that uh, when I look at your face, basically all that I'm seeing is your face and then everything else is blurred, right? Mm -hmm. I can see some, like I'm focused, I don't mean to stare at you, but, right? but, I, but I'm holding my gaze on you. I can be aware of other things, like I can say there's somebody in red with maybe the number 0 or 10, somebody in pink, somebody, I don't know what color there, I can't tell what color she is, like her clothing looks checked okay it looked checked to me it's striped right and you see like when you hold your gaze your eyes you're just looking taking data from here but our brain is amazing it truly is one of the most amazing most complicated machines if you will I think it's more than a machine but in the universe where what happens is taking all of this data my mind remembers what I saw here and integrates that together with all this as I scan my eyes all around what I'm really seeing is a mental model of this reality out there, right? Which is integrated or coded across multiple images. So anyway, so this is making the point that your central vision is 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 much more focused, much more crisp, 
much more detail oriented. Your peripheral vision has less and less, there are less and less cells concentrated, right? So like retinal cells and processing cells that are oriented towards processing the data that's coming to us from out here. So we really can't tell what's out there at the very periphery unless we move a hand. If we move a hand, we notice there's some kind of motion. I can't tell what it is that's, mov that's moving, right? And so that's, that's intended slash designed to make it possible for us when we notice a motion to look. Say, what's that? Is that a tiger coming to get me? Or is, it, or is it like the chocolate fairy bringing me lots of chocolate? Right? So this is just illustrating uh, visual illusions, if you will. Does that look like a straight line to you? That's not, right? It looks like it's broken and shifted. But if you draw, like on your book, if you go ahead and like put a ruler, you'll see that the straight line is actually a straight line. But to us, because of the way we process the data, it looks as if that straight line is broken and shifted. The dashes on the right, do they look the same size as these dashes? Yes. To me, these look shorter. Look over here, they look shorter than those, the ones in the center, right? Yeah. And again, if you look at the figure in your book, the those length of those is supposed to be the same as the length of that. Extra credit to you if you can make this uh, uh, out of wood this weekend in your garage uh, machine shop, and our metal is also fine. Gold would be great, and bring it to me. <laughs> right? So, do you think you can make this this weekend? <laughs> that really well done. I mean, you look at it, and it, like if you look at one part of it, it looks like it could be three-dimensionally, possibly. I mean, it could be realistic, right? So, but the more you look at it, the more you realize it just cannot work physically, right? So, this is an example. I think in a previous lecture, I talked about garbage in, garbage out with computer simulations. Oh no, that was a different lecture. <laughs> I gave a lecture at the ASU on Monday. Uh, to a bunch of grad students. And one of the things that I talked about there was computer simulation and I was mixing up the classes. Um, and I talked about garbage in, garbage out. That computer simulation by itself is not worth worth very much if you don't calibrate it to reality. It's e very easy to speculate or create a simulation that will do anything that you want it to do. But the moment you try to take the simulation and apply it to reality, the vast majority of the time it doesn't work. Reality doesn't work, it just doesn't match the simulations because you haven't done a good job of calibrating it, right? So this is a good example where we can do, make these beautiful drawings, but there's no way to create something like this in reality. Or this either, right? This looks like totally doable, don't you think? Until you look further up. So that's an example of an illusion. Okay, what does the sign say? <laughs> what did the sign say, except for you? Paris in the spring, right? You're right. That's what it said. Paris in the spring. Oh, did it? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're right. So that's part of the the, the illusion, if you will, with the way our brain processes this information. Paris in the spring. We neglect the second though because I've already got the data that I need, right? Now, the people who probably will will not miss the two, right, unless you're specifically observant for some reason, probably would be kids who are reading word by word. Right? Anytime you learn a language, you know that first you learn letters and you read that one letter. At some stage, you're trying to learn Hebrew, just out of interest. So I, I would have to read each letter one at a time, right? But then I never got past the point in Hebrew of being able to read anything more than one letter at a time. But... <laughs> <laughs> I could pronounce it though, right? Bereshit, bara. Okay. Anyway, um, so but in English, right? I don't see P A R I S. I just see the word Paris. Then, as you get better at reading, you don't even see words. You just see sentences or phrases. And then, as you get faster, you get ideas and concepts when you're reading, Mademoiselle. Like an entire paragraph, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. every single one of the words, the letters are mixed up. Yes, but you can read it. Yep, fine. yep. It's interesting. Yep. Extra credit to you. You're right. How old is she? I mean, what 14. grade? Fourteen. Okay. So like ninth grade. She's whatever the first year in high school is now. Is that ninth. Ninth. 
Okay, cool. That's that's yeah. Somebody had emailed me that paragraph at some stage. That would be a good one if you if you get get it from her. If it's electronic, if you can email it to me, mm -hmm. I can make a slide off of it and, and put it up for the class. Extra credit to you, right? You see R E R. Yes. Your brain just processes that and fills in the gap, right? Yep. Good point. So that's true even, I mean, all of us have a blind spot, right? Like there is a blind spot somewhere here. But what happens the vast majority of the time, we cannot tell where the blind spot is because your brain is, in, is it's looking at data all the way here up to the blind spot and it's just interpolating in between. Isn't that amazing?